May 1945 and the end of the Second World War. In a schoolhouse at Reims, France, the Germans formally surrendered to the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower. For Eisenhower, this was the climax to a spectacular military career. In three years, he had risen from the obscurity of a staff job in Washington to become the best known and best liked of a famous band of American generals. Eisenhower went on to become Army Chief of Staff, the highest post in his profession, then President of Columbia University. After a spell as first commander of NATO, he declared himself interested in even greater power, winning two terms as President of the United States. His eight years in the White House were years of calm, but they were also years of caution. In June 1944, Eisenhower prepared to lead the greatest operation of the war, the invasion of Europe, by a huge force of veteran soldiers and brilliant generals, the best known being Britain's General Montgomery. As an organizer, I think uh, Eisenhower was preeminent in his time. Of course, the success or failure of the invasion rested to a very great degree on the planning of the operation, planning which had started long before Eisenhower had become the supreme commander, and planning that had infinite variations, three elements, land, sea, and air, hundreds of thousands of troops, scores of thousands of ships, tens of thousands of aircraft. All this was built up into this enormous program for landing on a narrow front on the shores of Normandy. Now, you can say that the leadership was so delegated that Eisenhower had very little to do with the actual operation. That's only true up to a point. Eisenhower's gravest decision was the one that was forced on him by the weather when he had to decide whether they would go on the 6th of June or wait a month until the next good weather period. Eisenhower took the big decision to go. The decision turned out right. He went on from there to go down in history as the leader of the great invasion. At that time, when I would visit him coming back from First Army or from British Army Group, I was struck, as I had always had been in the past two years, by the candor, by the geniality of the man. He always seemed to have enough time talk about what was going on at the front, talk with great candor. He would admit weaknesses, failures, reverses. He would admit that sometimes his own instructions probably hadn't been well enough phrased. And he would admit difficulties with this commander or that, never, of course, to the point that a reporter could write about it. But this candor, this feeling that you're in on the Supreme Commander's problems and his day-to-day -day difficulties, enabled him to have a tremendous impact on the press. You felt that you knew what Ike's troubles were, and then, perhaps, you wouldn't be too critical. Now, of course, at this same time, during this period, he was beginning to spend a great deal of time with a great many important people, De Gaulle, Churchill, emissaries from Roosevelt who had come over. He began to see, I believe, how easy power could be wielded. 
I also think he began to realize that the presidency of the United States was certainly not beyond it. But there was an inborn caution in Eisenhower. He was smart enough to know that if he made the mistakes that MacArthur had made, of seeming to want this power too openly, it would never be his. And therefore, he conducted his campaign, his personal campaign, to become first candidate and then president with infinite guile, infinite adroitness, far more political sense, I would say, than he had shown in some of his military adventures. I can repeat only what I have so often said before. I intend to have nothing whatsoever to do with partisan politics. I will never seek political office. Uh, moreover, it is my conviction that a man who has spent his life in the professional military service should never enter partisan politics and seek an office. I think probably Mr. Truman was a little ingenuous when he said to Eisenhower, there's no job I won't help you get, Ike, and that includes President of the United States. Because if he thought he was giving Eisenhower a new idea, he was not. Eisenhower, I know, had contemplated that job for some months in the past. He's certainly at this time beginning to realize that he has a good chance to be nominated and elected. But I think he also realized at that period that he also had to have what bluntly could be called a civilian cover. He wasn't fooling when he said he didn't think a man should go from the military into the politics immediately. There had to be a transition period, and there was Columbia University. There will be no administrative suppression or distortion of any subject that merits a place in, the universe, in this university's curricula. The facts of communism, for example, shall be taught here. Its ideological development, its political methods, its economic effects, its probable course in the future. The he got Columbia God University, God then, today, unfortunately, I suppose, for his plans, up comes the Russian threat, the, the organization of NATO, the and the designation of Eisenhower as the first supreme commander. Best. But that doesn't hurt, eventually, because it emphasizes his ability in the bigger field of international politics. And also, at that time, I think he began to make it plain that he was a Republican and not a Democrat. It might have been conviction, it might have been opportunism, because it was quite evident, I think, that by the late 40s, early 50s that the Democrats had been in so long that a change would be inevitable. And he put himself on the side of change. Once the general sat was in the ring, there was no stopping the movement to make Eisenhower the Republican candidate for president. He was now launched onto his new career, or as his campaign slogan put it, a new crusade which would carry him to supreme power after November 1952. <laughs> 280, Eisenhower, 845. I know something of the solemn responsibility of leading a crusade. I have led one. take up this task, therefore, in the spirit of deep obligation, mindful of its burdens and of its decisive importance, I accept your summons. I will lead this crusade. We must be willing to accept whatever sacrifices may be required of us. A people that values its privileges above its principles soon loses both. The Republicans were back in power after an interval of 20 years. But there was a cancer eating away at the nerve cells of American democracy. The witch-hunting senator from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, Eisenhower, in quest of power, swallowed a great deal from McCarthy that you wouldn't expect a general of the United States Army to take, or a president of the United States. I feel that he was very slow in understanding that it wasn't just the liberals who were upset by McCarthy. It was a great many conservatives, the sort of people that Eisenhower respected and liked, 
and in fact envied because they had a lot of money a long time. He was not a man who got political nuances. He'd come into the game too late. In fact, it wasn't until McCarthy turned on Eisenhower's real mother, the army, that the first started to fly. McCarthy was eventually brought down by his colleagues in the Senate, but not by the president. His idea of governing the United States, of course, was to get as he, what he considered to be the best men as cabinet members, and again, as he had at shape, to be chairman of the board. Of course, it meant that he only took the very major decisions himself that people down the line were taking. But maybe that's part of the art of government for some people. A visit to Korea between his election and his inauguration led to Eisenhower's major success as president. In bringing the Red Chinese to agree to end the Korean War, Eisenhower mixed firmness with caution. It was a political style which was popular, but deceptive. In June 1950, following the aggressive attack on the Republic of Korea, the United States Seventh Fleet was instructed both to prevent attack upon Formosa and also to ensure that Formosa should not be used as a base of operations against the Chinese Communist mainland. Since the date of that order, the Chinese Communists have invaded Korea. I am therefore issuing instructions that the Seventh Fleet no longer be employed to shield Communist China. This well, here we see Eisenhower uh, using his military prestige with people to put a gloss on an action that really didn't mean much, unchain the Taiwanese. By doing that, he was raising the specter of invasion uh, of mainland China with its 900 million people by a couple of hundred thousand uh, Chinese on Taiwan. Now, the issue was a phony one, a bogus one, but it gave Eisenhower the picture of being this implacable foe of communism, which was very popular at the time, and uh, added to his prestige as this great international leader. ...of the commun communist purpose of world domination. We shall never cease to encourage such in September 1955, Eisenhower suffered a heart attack. At 65, it seemed his days of power were over, but he made a strong recovery and the attraction of office beckoned him on to run for a second term. Uh, let's say that there were many motives behind his decision to run for a second term after his illness. One, I think, was an undoubted dedication to the country. The second was a very strong lust for power and a, an enjoyment in the exercise of power. Uh, an enjoyment which my uh, experience has grows on people the longer they're in office. In the international field, I think he personified stability, a certain complacency, conformism, all of which were very popular in the United States in the 50s, and which were the hallmarks of his first term. And I don't think uh, it's completely to his discredit that he had this love of power because he believed that he could do something with it. The fact that he didn't is beside the point in this context. During Eisenhower's first term, a new star had risen over the Kremlin, Nikita Khrushchev, whose brutal suppression of the Hungarian bid for freedom caught Eisenhower by surprise in the 56 presidential campaign. In his second inaugural, Eisenhower answered Soviet deeds with speechwriters' cant. ...who pledged their lives to that love. Through the night of their bondage, the unconquerable will of heroes has struck with the swift, sharp thrust of lightning. Budapest is no longer merely the name of a city. Henceforth, it is a new and shining symbol of man's yearning to be free. The Hungarian thing really blew D Dulles's pretensions. He'd been talking about the rollback of communism in Eastern Europe. And in the event, he did nothing but talk. The joke was in, in those years in Washington of Eisenhower saying to Dulles, uh, don't do something for us, just stand there. He did have to restrain Dulles at times, and I think at, at other times Dulles went beyond his instructions from Eisenhower. He was a sort of diplomatic pattern who went off at all different angles occasionally, uh, possibly more effective with America's enemies than with her friends. Among those friends, Britain and France felt betrayed 
when America sabotaged their attempt to down Nasser of Egypt by invading Suez. Eisenhower was again taken by surprise. The Israeli government ordered total mobilization. On Monday, their armed forces penetrated deeply into Egypt and to, and to the vicinity of the Suez Canal, nearly 100 miles away. And on Tuesday, the British and French governments delivered a 12-hour ultimatum to Israel and Egypt, now followed up by armed attack against Egypt. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, for we do not accept the use of force as a wise or proper instrument for the settlement of international disputes. I've always believed that the handling of the Suez crisis uh, by the United States sowed the seed for a great deal of discord that followed later, say, almost the 67 war. Two years later, when civil strife hit Lebanon, Eisenhower sang a different tune. This civil strife has been actively fomented by Soviet and Cairo broadcasts, and abetted and, aid and aided by substantial amounts of arms, money, and personnel infiltrated into Lebanon across the Syrian border. A few hours ago, a battalion of United States Marines landed and took up stations in and about the city of Beirut. The Marines were welcomed by the Lebanese and no shots were fired. It was a safe enough move for the president to make. No longer holier than thou, Eisenhower now applauded when the British went to the aid of Jordan. Here was the country that uh, Dulles had criticized so sharply for going in, and here we were doing the same thing side by side with the British. But in the meantime, of course, some of our friends in Iraq and other countries had been shot or exiled, and the Middle East was an infinitely more difficult area for us to operate in after Suez than it was before. And it may be one of the great ifs of history if Dulles and Eisenhower had held their hand, let the French and British and Israelis do it, whether the history of the Middle East might have not been a great deal more stable. Eisenhower assumed the role of leader of the West. His geniality won him many friends among other world leaders, although they might not always trust the cautious nature of American policy. He got along very well with Macmillan. I don't think he ever got along well with the Gold, but then I don't think anybody did except probably Harold Macmillan. With Macmillan's support, Eisenhower made a great effort to lessen the tensions of the Cold War. In May 1960, a summit was due to be held in Paris. Hopes ran high for a global settlement, but shortly before, an American U-2 reconnaissance plane had been downed in the Soviet Union. In response to a furious Khrushchev, Eisenhower admitted responsibility for the flight. It was indeed a spy plane. The gesture was honest, but it wrecked the summit. I share the disappointment of my colleagues that because of our inability to convene the summit conference, we could make uh, no progress toward easing the tensions that so plagued mankind. The U-2 pilot's trial in Moscow put Eisenhower on the defensive. When we uh, admitted publicly that the U-2 belonged to us and it was on a reconnaissance mission, we were doing something that in a, in a modern world, that was the only way we could find out, get any information on a closed, out about a closed society. And the society was constantly threatening us uh, by uh, uh, every, by their strength, boasting about what they could do to the world and all the rest of it. Now, this does not put the United States on uh, trial whatsoever. If they were, if they want to say that they, uh, putting me on trial, that's their uh, privilege. But, uh, put the United States on trial in this way is just another piece of their propaganda that uh, distorts fact into their own uh, uh, line of, uh, of charge and allegation. By the end of his presidency, Eisenhower seemed unsure of his touch. The success of a guerrilla fighter in the jungles of Cuba, a certain Fidel Castro, hardly attracted his attention. American policy abroad all too often had to rest on corrupt and repressive regimes like the one Castro was fighting. 
Many of these regimes required support from the CIA, a new instrument of American policy. Cuba, like Vietnam, was a problem Eisenhower bequeathed to his successor, what Kennedy called the unfinished agenda of government. We look at Eisenhower's career, and towards the end, we must ask the question, what did it all matter? He did some great things, both as a military commander and as a president. But it seems to me that in the final phase, his performance was less than the United States or the world could have wished or expected. Partly, I think, this was because, although he's a man of greater intellectual capability than his enemies or indeed his friends ever admitted, he was, in that way, basically a little lazy. Secondly, he'd done it all. By the time he'd been elected president the second time, he had had almost every honor that a man could wish for. Thirdly, of course, his physical health was not as good as it had been. And fourthly, things began to run against him. Here he was, the head of the most powerful country in the world, a country which at that time was far superior to the Soviet Union in its financial strength, its industrial strength, and its military strength. By any measure you want to choose. So we see Eisenhower in his last years, adored by the masses of his countrymen, but still not quite fulfilling the great promise that people thought he had when he first became president of the United States. Eisenhower's is, I think, a story of lost opportunities.